So, Mr. Ryan, I will come to you first as our resident quarterback here on with the first pick. Let's start with Caleb Williams. Had an up and down season in terms of wins and losses, but I think if you watch the tape, watch what he was able to accomplish under some pretty trying circumstances with uh, a suspect offensive line at times and a defense that didn't help him out on the other side of the ball. Where are you on Caleb Williams and what does he look like to you as an NFL prospect as we get through this process? I mean, I'm still high on him. I, I know that, you know, the wins and losses uh, are, are attached to quarterbacks' names, but, you know, oftentimes a lot gets, you know, weighted on you that shouldn't, and sometimes, you know, some goes the opposite way as well. But to me, you know, when you watch him, his ability to throw the football, it, it, there's, no, there's just no doubt about it that he's going to translate to the NFL level, at least in my opinion, and, and be successful. Um, he can throw the football without his feet underneath him, which I think is crazy. Critical uh, in the league, you know, you're, you're going to get pass rush and you're going to have lanes that, you know, you've got to be able to manipulate the football. And I think he does that probably better, uh, for sure, better than anybody in this draft, but probably as good as anybody in the last handful of years. I think, you know, I watch him. I think his ceiling is as high as, as anybody's has been uh, in the last four or five years. Um, you know, I would say the floor, you know, is is maybe the question mark as as you look at at, at this season. But you know, his touch, his ability to drive the football, uh, his instinct, the ability to extend plays, to me, he's the perfect fit right now for the modern NFL. Matt, you'll get no argument from me. I'm with you on where Kayla Williams is as a prospect. And BMAC, I want to ask you, how much of this process as we get through this 107 days till the actual NFL draft is it going to be about the off field? perhaps maturity concerns with Caleb. How involved will his dad be? I've talked to teams that said that's a concern. I've talked to other teams that say it's not going to be an issue at all. We know what he can do on the field. Are you on board with uh, where Matt's coming from in terms of the evaluation? And are there any concerns about anything that has nothing to do with football, but perhaps the off the field stuff? Yeah, I agree with Matty Ice. When you talk about Caleb Williams, he's a natural thrower of the football. I love his ability to improvise because you know, when you're playing the games, playing the quarterback position in the National Football League, you're going to have to imp improvise. And he's he does so in a natural way. He's just a fluid thrower. He can make people miss. He can buy time. And even when things are not going accordingly, he can make it look like it was planned. Those are things that we like about his game, and those are things that I think will transition to the next level, and he should be successful in doing so. Now, when you talk about some of the other concerns that are not necessarily field-related, I mean, this is what the process is about. This is why you get an opportunity to visit so many organizations. This is why you get an opportunity when you go to the Combine to meet with so many teams so they can actually sit down and talk to you. Not all about ball, could be about life, could be about family, could, could be about other hobbies, so they can kind of get a good understanding about who you are, not just as a football player, but as an individual. So those questions, those concerns will be answered. But this is the process every year for draft prospects. We always hear about the positives, but every now and then they will there will be some potential concerns that people want to speculate more about. But at the end of the day, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do on and off the football field, he should be okay. And I think that's the case. I agree, B Mac. And what he did on the field felt like it separated himself for every other draft prospect we'll talk about in terms of the quarterbacks. And it's funny that you mentioned you'll get an opportunity to talk to these players off the field. Because, uh, Matt, I'll tell you a story. Uh, my buddy, a uh, uh, co-host on the With the First Pick podcast, Rick Spielman, said the most impressive player he ever talked to in his 30 years in the NFL during the pre-draft process uh, was some kid from Philadelphia who went to B.C. named Matt Ryan. So that's, that's high praise coming from a guy who doesn't pass out a lot of compliments, at least in my direction. Uh, but I want to ask you... And I'll lead in to your top five quarterbacks. Uh, who's QB1 for you? And if it happens to be Caleb Williams, my comp for Caleb, and you can respond to this throughout your uh, response here, is Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, it's my QB1. You know, it, it, it's my top prospect. And, and I agree with you uh, on the comp. I think that, you know, the, the, the style of play that he has is probably the most similar to, to Patrick Mahomes. And it's it's probably a really difficult thing for him, right, is is to have that comp because I, I've heard that from multiple people. I think it myself, right? You look at the off-schedule plays that he makes, 
um, you know, down the field too. That's it's one thing to make these off schedule plays and, and have them be, you know, the 10, 15 yard completions. It's another completely different thing to be able to move outside the pocket, be going hard to your left and throw the football 35, 40 yards down the field. Uh, and he's capable of doing that. I also think that his ability to, uh, to deliver from the pocket, right? And he's a sneaky, better runner than you think. I think those things all kind of align to, to Patrick Mahomes and how he plays. But to me, he's, he's the clear cut number one in this, in this draft. What do you think, B Mac? No, oh, no argument for me. Yeah. And the thing about Caleb Williams, when you look at his Heisman year and his numbers, you like, okay, outstanding numbers, video game like numbers, right? But then when you look at what he did this year and what we consider to be a down year for Caleb Williams based on the talent, you still you still like in awe of his numbers. I mean, the man still balled out on a team that wasn't as good as they were the year before. He still put up outstanding winning like numbers. Unfortunately for Caleb, he couldn't cover anybody or tackle because their defense was, was more of an issue than anything they were doing on the offensive side. He's a natural thrower of the football. I oftentimes say when you talk about football players and just watching them, you know, critiquing them, you can tell some players were born to play one particular position. Caleb Williams was born to play quarterback, and he's ex excelled in doing so. I couldn't agree more. And as Matt mentioned and BMAC, you touched on the off schedule throws. He gets dinged for that for holding on to the ball too long. But when you dig into the numbers, he gets rid of the ball in three seconds or less about half the time on his dropbacks. And Patrick Mahomes does that when you look at him now. It's worked out pretty well for him, but certainly the system matters and where he lands in terms of the NFL team matters as well. All right, Matt, let's go to number two here. And I haven't seen the list, but just in case it happens to be Drake May, Rick Spielman's comp for Drake May is Trevor Lawrence. Mine is a little closer to Daniel Jones. So is it somewhere on that spectrum or is there another name you have in mind once you talk about Drake May from UNC? I, th I think they're fair. I, th I think it's probably more like a Trevor Lawrence than a Daniel Jones, I, I think that, you know, to me, I, when I watch him, I, I think he's a guy that throws the football naturally, right? And he's his ability to run, um, again, I think he's sneaky athletic. He, he does a lot of those things. I think it's similar to a Caleb Williams, too, in that, you know, you might have, ha have had the success – you know, as a team or put up the statistics or all of these things. But you, when you watch the throws that actually translate to what's going on in the NFL right now and the plays that they're running and, and, and kind of the scheme that they're playing with, to me, like this throw right here, driving this football down the field into the end zone uh, with effortless power, the little back shoulder fade that they use, those are all things that that you've got to do, and you, it's got to be natural for you uh, at, at the professional level. And I think for him, it's a lot of the things that he does well are the things that translate to playing well uh, in the National Football League. And so for me, I think, you know, his college career, I think he's a better pro than he was a college player. Statistically, winning-wise, all of those things, I just think he has the skill set that translates to the NFL. That's a great point, and Matt. That's why because it's so hard to, to figure out what college looks like at the next level. BMAC, I'll ask you, where are you on, on Drake May? And there are some conversations. Some NFL teams think that it'll be closer uh, in, in terms of who the first QB is off the board. Could you see Drake May perhaps going first? And what do you like about his game, and how does that translate to the NFL? Well, he wouldn't go first on my board. No knock to Drake, but Caleb is just that guy. You know, Caleb would have been the first quarterback to come off the board a year ago if he was eligible and that's saying a lot because you know that class had CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson and of course Bryce Young involved so no knock on Drake May but I think he is the quarterback too when you look at this class uh, my NFL cop is a little more closer to Justin Herbert but not this that arm strength that we see from Justin Herbert but the measurables uh, the athleticism the accuracy you talk about uh, uh, Matt being able to uh, complete passes in tight spaces tight windows He's shown the ability to do so. And I believe, I agree with Matt also, I think he's going to be a better pro than college player because if he goes into the right situation, he's going to excel and be a big-time contributor for that said organizations. When you talk about some of the players that we're talking about, the quarterback position, all of these guys are overly talented. But it's more about going into an ideal situation where they can take advantage of that talent and put you in position to be able to perform and lead as a leader. And that's what I'm hoping that we see happen with these quarterbacks because these guys can do numbers, they can put up points, they can win ball games. But if they're not, if they're not used the right way, we will never see their skill set flourish. I believe K Drake May has what, it, has what it takes to be able to flourish and potentially be a Pro Bowler. 
BMAC, that's an incredibly important point that you made about the landing spot and the people around him, both players and, and coaching staff. And the Justin Herbert comp is actually a pretty good one because Justin Herbert's last year at Oregon wasn't lights out, and there were questions, but you have to be able to sort through what was based on the offense that he played in in college and then what the physical tools look like at the next level. And that's why this is so incredibly difficult. But that's okay. That's why we have you guys here to explain it for us. All right, Matt, let's go to QB3. I think I know who it is, and if it's the guy I think it is, I'll start with this. I don't think any player helped himself more this fall in terms of improving his draft stock. And my comp for who I think it is, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I got Jaden Daniels, and, and I agree with you. I think it is it is the L Lamar Jackson comparison. And to me, I like I don't. I think Caleb is is clear one. I think Drake is is a two. But this might be the most intriguing prospect uh, in in terms of of the entire skill set. Uh, and, and his ability to use his legs. I mean, he throws the football down the field with effortless power, but the, his ability to run is the thing that if you can get him in the right situation, and BMAC talked about it, being you know being in a good situation where you're surrounded by a lot of things. Like Lamar was lucky to get to Baltimore where they're playing good defense, and he could evolve a bit as a passer, and he has, and he's turned into one of the most dynamic players. But the thing that got him going was his legs, and I think Jaden's very similar in that. Um, and I think, in all honesty, it's the legs and the ability to take off and run at any time that's the thing that drives defensive coordinators more crazy than the ability to pass the football. And so to me, this is probably the most intriguing prospect of, of all of the quarterbacks in the draft because his ability to run is dynamic. And so uh, I think he translates well to the NFL. I think, you know, the, the, the position has changed and, and what is asked of the position has changed, you know, predominantly in the last four or five, six years. And, and his skill set and what he brings into it uh, to me, it's it, it might be the most intriguing prospect in this draft. BMAC, let me ask you, number one, I want to get your thoughts on Jaden Daniels and, and the progress he made during the fall of 2023. But as a cornerback, how difficult it is to play against someone who has that sort of breakaway speed? Because once he gets through to the second level, you don't want to be the guy on tape that can't run him down in the secondary. So, so how is that approach when you're playing cornerback against someone who you know that can do damage with their arms and with their legs as well? It's very, very difficult because, you know, not just from the cornerback side of things, but the entire secondary safeties and nickels, you know, these are guys that we consider to be a plus one in the running game, but we can't account for them especially when they're running on passing plays. You know, oftentimes when you see guys playing man-to-man -man and we're covering wide receivers, we're usually facing the wide receiver and our back is facing the offensive formation. So we don't know that they're running until it's too late, until we actually look on the big screen and see a guy running right behind us or we happen to look back and now we're in chase mode. That's why these guys are so valuable in today's in, in today's NFL because they're a plus one. Go back and look at Jalen Hurts a year ago. Go back and look at how effective he was in the running game, just improvising, making things happen. The, the same can be said for a guy like Pat Mahomes. And that's why Lamar Jackson is so prolific in what he does because you can't account for a guy that is actually a running back playing the quarterback position. I agree with you as well. I agree with Matty Ice. I think the nearest player comp is Lamar Jackson. I would love to see Jaden Daniels uh, uh, eat a little more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> so he can put a little more weight put a little more weight on him because, you know, Matty Ice, he's going to take a lot of hits. I don't care how fast you are. We got guys that can run on the defensive side as well. So Jaden Daniels, eat a little more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to put more weight on you. But I've seen him play two times at LSU, right? And both times I saw him play, I was amazed because we always knew he was an athletic guy, but just his ability to really put the football where it needs to be put and throw wide receivers open. Anytime if you're an LSU quarterback and you're looking for a house in the same neighborhood that Joe Burrow used to live at, you've done some great things. And if his numbers, based on his numbers, what he did this past year, they're right there in the same neighborhood as Joe Cool Burrow the year he won the Heisman. So Jaden Jaden Daniels, man, is an unbelievable perform at the quarterback position and you said it best he did himself a lot in coming back balling for lsu winning the heisman and he will be a top 10 selection lamar jackson right, right. oh go I'll ahead follow up one thing too i think bmac is so right too on just he evens up the numbers for an offense in the run game and his ability to run the football to me gives him you know a year two or three to develop as a passer because it's he didn't have to be perfect in the passing game to be able to do it. And I think I think that is the thing that's intriguing, too, because 
it allows time for him to develop into you know that that pocket type of passer that you need to be on third down and in the red zone uh, in the NFL. And so uh, I'm I'm high on this guy. I'm really looking forward to see where he you know he winds up. And to follow up on the points that both of you made, landing spot and coordinator make a ton of difference, right? Because Lamar Jackson arrived in Baltimore. Greg Roman felt like the right fit at the right time, and he has expanded his arsenal. He's one of, the, if not the best quarterback in the NFL, certainly this season, probably going to win the MVP and deservedly so. All right, Matt, let's go to QB number four. I really don't, I can't remember who QB four is, so I won't give you my comp, but but I want to hear who he is. I'll give you. What's that? Yeah, I'll give you mine. So. Okay. I got I got Michael Penix Jr. Oh, okay. Let's go. As as number four, and I know last night was probably not the best thing for him. Uh, my comp is Tua Tua Tonga Valoa, and so to me, I, I think he's similar. I mean, obviously left-handed quarterbacks, but when you watch, you know what he did in that Texas game and the ability to throw the football on time accurately with anticipation, it reminds me a lot of how Tua played. I actually think he's got a stronger arm uh, or, or he's got an arm with more power uh, than Tua Tonga Valoa. But I think he's a guy that, although he didn't play last night, you know, he got beat up a little bit last night too. And, and it's hard to complete the football when you're laying on your back or you're getting hit left and right. But I think he's a guy that that is an accurate passer. His health concerns are very similar to what Tua went through in college as well. Uh, you know, so I, I think he's a guy that given the right situation, given the right fit, given Given the right coordinator, much like a Tua Tonga Valoa with Mike McDaniel, that marriage, where you're finding a guy that fits that play action pass game, can layer the football over the middle of the field, you know, throw it without a conscience, too. Like Michael Penix, when I watch him, he throws without a conscience. He throws it early. He trusts his guys to be in the right spot. He's throwing to spots. I, I kind of liken him to that. I like the way he plays, and uh, I'm interested to see where he winds up. Uh, funnily enough, Matt, mine was a stronger arm to a Tonga by Loa, so I'm not copying off your paper. It makes me feel better about myself. Uh, BMAC, you're a huge Michael Penix Jr. fan. I think he's helped himself a ton the last two seasons at Washington after transferring from Indiana. Matt talked about the injuries he suffered. Last night was not his best night. He missed high, which he rarely did. He missed on deep throws, which felt like long handoffs throughout the course of the season. Any concerns about his performance against the best defense he certainly faced all season in Michigan and how that might look once he gets to the NFL where every defense is going to be legit? No, I have no concerns. Uh, of course, you know, we would love to see him play better, but if you look at his collegiate car career in totality, especially this year, before last night's national championship game against Clemson, guys, he played against six ranked opponents. So those teams had six ranked defenses, right? He put up around 300 yards per ball game, 13 touchdowns, 13 touchdowns. So he carved up some of the best teams he's faced off against this year. Another thing I like about him is that some people might criticize him for this, but he's been around the game of football for a long, long time, meaning he's seen a lot. He has a lot of reps. The experience is something that you can't buy. Remember, his, his freshman campaign was the year 2018. And of course, he was dealing with multiple injuries that kind of set him back. He had the COVID year, and then he was able to transfer to Washington. But he's seen a lot of reps. Those are things you can't coach because that provides experience in many different moments of ball game, situational moments, red zone, P and 10 coming out, you know, in, in between the 20s, two minute situations. He's been around the game for quite some time and he's been able to excel. And oh, the last thing I really love, he's a winner. He was able to go out to Washington, right? At a time where Washington was trying to figure things out, revitalize that program, made them a national program. Even a year ago, they had a lot of success and it had to do with the quarterback play. And Matty Ice, I say this all the time, mostly weekly, and you know this better than anybody. If you don't have a quarterback, the field feels like it's 150 yards. That's what it feels like you have to drive. I mean, you can ask your Atlanta Falcons about that based on what happened at the quarterback position this year. But when you have a quarterback and he can dial up numbers, you're going to score points. Michael Pennis is a winner. My only concern is, like Matty Ice stated, the injuries. What will the medical report reveal? Will everything come back clean enough for him to be able to go where he needs to go? I hope so because he's a proven first-round talent. BMAC, two ACLs and two shoulder injuries, but in Michael Penix Jr.'s defense, he's been healthy the last two years. He rarely takes sacks. He's incredibly savvy in the pocket. He's probably a better athlete than people may give him credit for. All things to keep in mind. And, and Matt, I'll ask you quickly because I, I'm going to throw out a number and people may not have a, a, what it, in terms of what it means until I, I get an answer from you. But Michael Penix has 11-inch hands reportedly. Do you know what your hand size was when you went through the process? 
<laughs> no, I don't know what it was. I don't think they're that big. You okay, know, I think like they're, they're not bad, but uh, the average quarterback they're... hand size is probably nine and a half inches. So Michael Penix is 11, and it looks like he's holding a softball. No, I know. It looks like he's throwing like the old Nerf Turbo that I grew up throwing, right? Where you could just spin that thing and it, and it would go anywhere. I think it does make a difference, right? And, and when you watch him throw the football, I mean, he doesn't throw wobblers, right? The, the, the ball comes off, it is tight. And so depending on where you play, like I was lucky. I played in a dome. It was cool. You didn't have to worry about the conditions all the time. But if you're playing in weather or you're going out to like different places, you better spin the football because the only way to cut through the wind is to make sure that ball's spinning really well. And when you got big hands like that, uh, it makes a difference for, for being able to do that. And, and I, when I watch him, I mean, he spins it as tight as anyone. Absolutely, and that's going to be something else to keep an eye on as we go through the process here. All right, Matt, let's get to QB5 on your list. And I think it was the guy who had to face Michael Penix Jr. last night. And I'll give you my comp, and then you can explain where he fits here. I think he's a more accurate Desmond Ritter. <laughs> it hit me close to home with the Falcons here. <laughs> and I just covered this game the other night. Uh, listen, I, I, I think if, if this guy comes out, I don't think he was asked to do too much at Michigan, right? But I don't discount Jim Harbaugh's comments on him either of the way that he was the best quarterback in Michigan history, right? Like Jim Harbaugh knows what it looks like to play winning football at the NFL level. He took a team in, in, in the San Francisco 49ers to the Super Bowl. So this guy understands, you know, what what good quarterback play looks like, what that looks like at the NFL level as well. And I think when you're around somebody every day and you see how they work and you see how they perform and you see what they do in practice and you get a feel for, for how they compete, to me, th th there's a lot of weight that comes with that. And so I, I, I think he's got a longer delivery. His delivery's got a little bit of length to it in the way back, which you know I, I typically love like a guy with a quicker, tighter release. But his ability to throw the football on the sideline, particularly in the last two games, right, in, in the Rose Bowl and then in the National Championship game, when he extended plays onto the sideline, holding onto the football late and then being able to drive it, you know, on the sideline with power. Uh, to me, a system like, uh, and I say this, but a system like the Niners uh, or, or the Dolphins or something like that where, where guys are asked to move a lot, right, heavy utilization of, of the play-action game, to me, he'd be a good fit in that type of system. Um, and, and I'm curious to see. Like, like I, I don't think he was a guy that was asked to just drop back and pass during his time at Michigan, so it's tough to be able to say, can he carry the load? Uh, but I weigh you know, what Jim Harbaugh had to say into him in this decision. And then also, you know, his ability to throw on the run is is impressive. There's no doubt about the athleticism and the arm strength. Uh, I do want to see more, but as you point out, Matt, he wasn't asked to do that in that offense. Maybe he returns, maybe he comes out. We'll find out together. All right, let's take a look at Matt's top five quarterbacks as we sit here, 107 days from the draft. There you have it, Caleb at the top. J.J. McCarthy, national title winner at number five there. 